Hi students, welcome to the Baidu Sindhu News Analysis for 27th of October 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says Sri Lanka's unity government falls Rajapaksa sworn in as Prime Minister. So what is the context here? So when we look into the context, there is political crisis, turmoil, disorder and chaos in the political setup of the Sri Lankan government. So what is happening right now is Sri Lankan President Matripala Sirisena's party that is United People's Freedom Alliance has announced its decision to quit the unity government. So what we have to consider in this case is that Vikrama Singhe who is currently the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka is removed and what we have is the appointment of Mahinda Rajapakshe as the Prime Minister Minister of Sri Lanka. So what is the overall context and what is the constitutional crisis that we are seeing in this context is what this article all about. So when we look into the background what it goes on to say is there was that internal conflict that was happening between Prime Minister Vikramasinghe as well as with Sirisena and what they had also come was in 2015. So they wanted to make sure that President back then Mahinda Rajapakse was an authoritarian regime and this regime was to be replaced and that is when Prime Minister Vikrama Singhe as well as Sirisena had joined hands together. Why? Because they wanted to make sure that they wanted to upheaval the majority rule on authoritarian rule of Mahinda Rajapakse. And now what we see is that these two partners have divided and what we have is Mahinda Rajapakse coming back and joining hands with Sirisena. So what is the major conflict that we see in this case? So the major conflict that we see see in Vikrama Singhe as well as the Sirisena is two fronts. So what are we speaking about? One is on the economic front, the other is on the security front. So what are we speaking about the security front? When we are speaking about the security front, the most important point is we did see in the last weeks of newspaper that there was one of the assassination plot that was mild against the Sirisena. So what Sirisena says is you Vikrama Singhe should have been very careful and there is a conspiracy to kill me to assassinate me so it becomes very important to look into the security aspect which you are neglecting so that is why he says the security aspect which should have been the most important is not taken up and that is why as the president says there is security lapses and this needs to be looked into and the second important point he speaks about is on the economic front we did discuss when we were speaking about the palaya airport as well as the trincom that there is one of the terminals port in the Colombo and this was the major part of conflict. Why? Because Indian authorities wanted to take over this terminal and this Sirisena was opposing to. Vikrama Singhe wanted that this terminal at the Colombo port should be given to India so that there would be certain development. But Sirisena was opposing this move and that also became a major point of conflict. So two important points that became a source of conflict is the security as well as the economic front and that was in reference to the container terminal in Colombo. So what is of importance right now is that this particular act of Sirisena has been termed as unconstitutional by Vikrama Singhe. Why? Let's go back to 2015. So 2015 we did discuss that Rajapaksa had an authoritarian regime and both these people came up together to form what is called as unity government in 2015. And the minute they stepped into the government, they brought about a lot of changes in the constitution and one such important constitution constitutional mandate was the design of the 19th constitutional amendment act. So what happened during this period is because there was lot of powers that was given to the president what these people under the unity government came up and did is they restricted certain amount of powers and then certain amount of powers were divested of the president and one such power was that president would not be able to remove the prime minister. So the 19th constitutional amendment Amendment Act clearly says that the president will not be able to remove the prime minister until and unless he has a clear-cut two-third majority 
in the parliament but what is the problem right now so when we look into the article 42 of the constitution it goes on to say that the president shall appoint as prime minister the member of parliament who in the president's opinion is most likely to command the confidence of the house so according to sirisena what he says is that rajapakshe has the command of the parliament and that is why we have appointed mahinda rajapakshe as the prime minister but what does vikrama singh say here this is in reflection of article 46 of 2 so the prime minister shall continue to hold office throughout the period during which the cabinet ministers continues to function under the provisions of the constitution unless he resigns his office by a writing under his hand and address to the president or ceases to be a member of parliament so what Vikrama Singhe says is have I given resignation to Sirisena here no not actually I am retaining as a member of parliament and I haven't produced my resignation to the president and how is that the president is able to remove me so this article clearly says that you would not be able to remove me because I have not given you the resignation letter and have not ceased to be a member of parliament but you have caused for a dissolution of the parliament so the minute you actually remove me what this means is dissolution of the parliament so he says whatever the move that has been taken by Sirisena is completely unconstitutional and this should not have been done so even if it is done under the 19th amendment what it calls for is the two-third majority and what is the important point currently is that these people join up of parties that is Rajapakshe's party as well as Sirisena party do not come in two-third of the majority so how is that you would be able to remove me is a question that Vikrama Singhe goes on to ask but why is it of importance to us that is because it is always associated that Rajapakshe was closer to China he embraced China and it is he who let all these important developments take with respect to Sri Lankan as well as the Chinese but at the same time India also had a close watch with respect to Sirisena and Vikrama Singhe is believed to be closer to India and he wanted number of developmental projects to be taken by India in Sri Lanka so what decides the geopolitics is the leadership in this case and India is having a close watch with all that is happening in Sri Lanka so what is important is it is the leadership that defines the geopolitics of the region and Vikrama Singhe being closer to India and Rajapaksa say being closer to China India is having a constant watch as to what is happening in the region of Sri Lanka so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article moving on let's look into the next article so this article speaks about Samajik Adhikarika Shivir so this is one of the ads that was posted on page 2 and this is important from the GS paper 1 in the social issues how is it related this is in the empowerment process of the disabled people so what is of importance to us is that this can be a prospective question in your prelims examination so what are the things that we are supposed to know so this is one of the important programs that has been initiated by Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities that is Divyanjan under the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment so kindly remember that Samajik Adhikarika Shivar is one of the important schemes by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment so what is the objective of this so the objective of this is distribution of aid and assistive devices to Divyanjan and senior citizens under ADI as well as the Rashtriya Vayoshri Yojana so what is this ADIP that we are speaking about so this is one of the schemes to assist the needy disabled person in procuring durable sophisticated scientifically manufactured appliances that can promote their physical social and psychological rehabilitation by reducing the effects of disabilities and enhance their economic potential so the key to this is to enhance their economical potential so what are we doing in this case we are giving them all that is required so that they are empowered they are financially independent and they don't come under the umbrella of any of the other people so by providing them all these aid what the government is planning to do is 
it is planning to empower them so that they stand up on their own feet and they're not dependent on any other people so another important point that we have to consider in this case is that all these equipments that are provided will have to meet the standards of BIS so what is BIS in this case it is nothing but the Bureau of Indian Standards so there would be certain specifications that would be provided by the Bureau of Indian Standards so all these important disabled sophisticated and scientifically manufactured appliances that would be given to the disabled people should have to meet the BIS standards so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says farm loan waiver not a permanent solution and what is this all about this is in reference to one of the prizes that was received by Swaminathan and that is the world agriculture prize so what is of importance in this article is that the renowned agricultural scientist and the chief architect of the Indian Green Revolution, M.S. Swaminathan was awarded the first World Agriculture Prize for all his contributions to the Indian agriculture. And what is of importance is two important facts that is in respect to the World Agriculture Prize. So what does it say? So this is in reference to the prize and that is instituted by the private think tank so it is not the government which is providing this it is a private think tank that is Indian Council for Food and Agriculture so who is providing this World Agriculture Prize it is the Indian Council for Food and Agriculture so kindly remember this this can be a prospective question in your prelims examination and this award includes a cash of about one lakh dollar and this would be given for all those people who are able to create an impact in fighting the hunger as well as creating a revolution in the agriculture so this becomes important because the first award is given to Swaminathan and on this particular dais what Swaminathan goes about speaking is that all the form loan waivers the different states recently we see it in Punjab in Uttar Pradesh Karnataka and wherever there is a political setup in case political parties are going about giving form loan after farm loan then this could be a problem to the macroeconomic principles so what he says is that farm loan waiver is not a permanent solution but instead what we need is certain structural reforms and it is these structural reforms that the government needs to work with rather than coming up with certain temporary provisions like the farm loan waiver so what he says is this farm loan waiver could be a potential threat to the macroeconomic principles of economy so kindly avoid it but instead rework on the structural paradigm that is important from the economic stability so this is all we have to understand with reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says Pakistan's ban on Syed's outfit lapses so what is the context here so the context here says India question Pakistan's commitment to fighting terrorism following reports that Jammatu Dawa and its associate group Fahed Insaniyat Foundation are no longer on the list of banned organizations so what we are speaking is in reference to the FATF grey list so what is that we are speaking about one of the important questions that speaks in terms of terrorism as well as money laundering is this FATF so the financial action task force is one of those intergovernmental bodies which basically maintain two lists so what are the two lists that we are speaking about one is the gray list which is the list that is maintained the other is the black list so what happens in this case is you have the gray list that is those countries which have certain laws that are there to fight money laundering as well as terrorism but these are structurally flawed so those countries which have the presence of laws but these laws are comparatively weak so you have the laws but these laws when they are weak such countries will be posted under the grey list that is they have laws but these laws are comparatively weaker and there are certain structural flaws where there are loopholes where the company or the organization that is terrorist outfit will not be able to fit in why because they are extracting maximum mileage because of these loopholes and the weaker structure and there are certain other countries which are also posted in what is called as the blacklist so what are these blacklist countries so these are the countries which do not 
not even have the laws so they do not have any laws to fight the menace and threats and dangers of money laundering as well as terrorism so this is to do with FATF grey list as well as the blacklist but why are we discussing this the simple reason is Pakistan is put in this grey list why is Pakistan put in the grey list is the next question that pops up for which what we have to understand is that Pakistan has been failing years after years to fight the threats that have been emanating from money laundering as well as terror finding so there are certain guidelines that these guidelines are provided by the financial action task force so every country will have to comply by it but what Pakistan has repeatedly done is because of its weak setup and because of its idea of bad terrorism and good terrorism it has failed to meet the demands of the financial action task force so because it has failed to meet the demands of the financial action task force that is why FATF has put Pakistan in the grey lift why because there are certain organizations let's say for example the UN based terror groups like the Taliban or the Haqqani network or the Jaishi Mohammed and so on and in this article what we are speaking is that Jamaat Dawa is currently nowhere linked to this list which is there in the grey list so there are certain organizations which are supposed to be co so called banned organizations and this was put earlier and now what we see is that it is no more there in that list that the financial action task force has provided and that is why India has said that Pakistan is not retaining this and it is not put this Jammatu Dawa that is led by Hafiz Sayyid in the grey list that's the prominent thing so what we also need to understand is what is the implications now that Pakistan is put in the grey list what would be the implications to Pakistan so the major important point of this article is the implications so we will have to understand the important points from the implications perspective so the first point that we will understand is the image so what will happen to the image of Pakistan so the minute a country is put in a grey list all other countries start seeing this country in a negative light so there would be reputational stake when it comes to that country which is put in the grey list so what is the first implication of it all other countries that is the developed countries the other developing countries will start seeing Pakistan in a very negative light and this will have a reputational stake to Pakistan so that's the first thing that is the implication and the second important point is the minute they are put on this list what will happen is all these countries will come under the direct monitoring of the financial task force and the minute they are into direct monitoring this can result into again the negative image so what will happen in this case is there will be direct monitoring and intense scrutiny by the international cooperation review group and this group is a part of the financial action task force and when there is constant monitoring other countries will start seeing Pakistan in a very negative light and the third important point is the cost of doing business so what will happen in this case is let's say for example there is one of the important companies and it wants to do business in Pakistan but it feels that there are certain security threats and there are security lapses so what this country will go on to do is because it feels that there is a security threat and security lapses what it will command Pakistan is that it wants more security so there is a company that is coming into Pakistan and now Pakistan will have to provide a lot of security personnel why because the company is con coming here and when they have to come here Pakistan has to increase the budget to provide the security so the cost of business in Pakistan may further increase why because those countries feel that doing business in Pakistan could be a threat to their personnel and threat to their people so they seek more protection and when there is more protection what you need is more budget and that is the reason as to why cost of business comparatively increases and the next important point that we have to consider is all the loans that important countries are provided by the IMF and the World Bank will comparatively reduce why because let's say for example IMF is planning to give Pakistan certain loans or the World Bank is planning to give Pakistan certain loans so what would happen in this case is they would have a perception that all these money or the loans that are provided to the Pakistan 
would be deviated to certain other organizations or to certain other terrorist outfits because pakistan breaks them down into good terrorism and bad terrorism so they have this negative perception that is created so what is the resultant is pakistan getting loans would be comparatively difficult from all the developmental banks like the asian developmental bank or the world bank and the fifth important point that we have to consider is the downgrade of the debt rating every country has its own bond market and it also releases the security so what will happen is the bond market will comparatively reduce because of its negative image that is created all over and finally because of its rating going down the macroeconomic principle as a whole will go for a problem so these could be the possible implications when any country is put in the gray list and what pakistan has to do is it has to rework on its image in case it is not able to put all these terrorist organizations and stop their funding or make sure that money laundering is not taking place then this country will be put into the blacklist and when it is put into blacklist what you will see is further sanctions and then country will face a lot of problems so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says touching base so what is he important here that prime minister narendra modi is going on a two day visit on to japan on october 28th as well as 29th so what is of importance in this article is that we understand what would be the possible agenda of prime minister narendra modi in japan for which we will have to understand the japan's perspective we will have to understand the indian perspective what would be their common agenda and how is that they would be able to reflect on these number of thoughts for which first let's understand what would be the agenda of prime minister narendra modi currently what we see is india and japan has two types of possible threats and misunderstanding and these type of threats and misunderstanding emanates on the economic front as well as on the strategic front on the economic front what we see is in terms of the united states of america and on the security and the geopolitical front what we see is a threat that is emanating from china first let's try to understand in terms of united states of america so what is happening let's understand the indian perspective first so when we understand india's concern the first point that pops up in this particular case is the american tariffs so we have been seeing with time that there has been a constant trade war that happening in and around the world so there have been sanctions after sanctions tariffs after tariffs that have been imposed in america so the custom duties have been comparatively increased in terms of aluminum in terms of steel so this has created a problem to all the countries whether it is the european countries whether it is canada whether it is china whether it is japan or india so all countries are facing the brunt why because there has been tariffs that have been imposed by the usa government and one such important thing that is happening is in reference to the review of the gsp status so so what we have to understand in this case is what is this gsp that we are speaking about so this gsp that is being spoken about is one of the trade programs of the united states of america so what is this trade program is the question that pops up so what happens in this case is you have the number of countries so you have the developing countries and the underdeveloped country so what happens in united states of america is they give certain amount of permissions to these developing countries as well as the under developing countries to the opening up of their economy so what it means is certain products from the developing as well as under developed will have zero tariffs or less amount of tariffs in comparison to the other world trade organizations and the countries so what you see is that this is a trade program that was initiated in the year 1976 by the us under the trade act of 1974 and who takes control of it so this is under the control of united states trade representatives so this is also has certain criteria so we did define that there would be certain tariffs which will be reduced or it will be zero for certain products that are coming from the developing as well as the underdeveloped world but 
United States of America can also come up with certain criteria. So when we speak of criteria, the two important criteria. So what are the two important criteria? One of the important criteria is in case we are granting the benefit to the beneficiary country that is India in this case, what is also of importance is there is a policy conditionality. So in case you are accepting the benefits, what you should also provide is equitable and reasonable access to your markets as well. So the first criteria is in case you are planning to sell your products to United States of America, what you should also provide is reasonable access to your markets. And the next second criteria that it speaks about is this act will be reviewed every now and then and when we review it, we can take you out of this list or we can keep you under this list. When we are under this list, you will have certain incentives but when you are able to, when we are removing you off this list, whatever important benefits that were being generated will be completely stripped off. So what United States of America has done is it has gone about an annual review with respect to the India and what it currently says is that it is looking forward to put India off this GSP trading status and what we have to understand is if India is removed out of this India will have certain issues in terms of its economic planning but why does USA want to do it USA has got certain representations where it has said that there are certain industry lobbying which is working to make sure that there is India which is lifted off the status. Why? Let us try to understand this. So one of the important industries that is there in United States of America is the dairy industry. So what the dairy industry says is that India is creating a lot of barriers. So United States of America has said that India needs to provide reasonable access to its market but India is not providing access to the market. It has time and again created certain trade barriers that were the dairy products of United States of America is not getting access in India and that is because of the trade barriers which has been raised in India. So it has raised this request with respect to the USTR and also what we have to consider is the medical devices. So there are organizations and companies which work on the medical devices but India did have a price control mechanism where it has imposed certain restrictions and price with respect to the coronary stumps as well as the knee implants. So in reference to the coronary stents as well as the knee implants, what these medical device organizations is that we are not generating enough profit because of this cap that has been imposed by the Indian government. So what it goes on to say is because the diary does not have the suitable access, that is there are trade barriers and because due to cap of a particular product in terms of the knee and as well as the coronary stents, what we are seeing is that India is not providing reasonable access and that is why India needs to be taken off this list and that is why India is becoming a cause of worry. So what India has done in the past is India has got lot of benefits in the past. So India is able to get a lot of profits in the past. Let's take for example in the year 2017. So in the year 2017 under GSP there was about 21.2 billion dollars of product that was sold in United States of America. Under this 21.2 India was the highest beneficiary which generated about 5.6 billion. So it is able to get maximum extraction in the US market and these would be in terms of the automobile components or in the machinery mechanical appliances in terms of the jewelry sector. So India is able to extract maximum mileage and profits in terms of all these sector and it is one of of the first in the GSP list but currently because of all these allegations that were supposed by the diary as well as the medical organization what we see is that this is what United States of America says that the status that India is currently being given will be completely taken off if India is not given reasonable access. So this is one of the important points and apart from this India also has other set of problems in terms of the Iran's 
negotiation of petrol and diesel and india did have a recent engagement with russia where they went about purchasing s 400 so usa is planning to add india on certain sanctions because it has close coordination with iran as well as with russia so this is what the indian side of approaches and the same time what we will also have to look at is from the japan's worries so what are japan's worries so the same trade tariff that was discussed in reference to india is also also a point of concern to Japan and apart from this what Japan also has is United States of America was playing a key role in the security of the Indo-Pacific region and it had also created one of the important paradigms of trans-Pacific partnership in the South Asia so what is currently happening is because they completely came out of this group because of the presidentship of Donald Trump what we see is there is a vacuum that is created and because there is a vacuum all these important countries in the Southeast Asian countries are in the lap of China so what was one of the close and the important acquaintances of Japan and a close important partner of Japan was United States of America and all these countries were closer to United States of America but currently what we see is because there is a vacuum created because of it withdrawing itself from the trans-pacific partnership all these important countries have come under the influence of China and this can be a problem to Japan so apart from this the US on again of again nuclear negotiations with North Korea which is also keeping Tokyo on the tenter hooks so they are not able to take an independent stand with reference to North Korea but at the same time China China is getting closer and closer with respect to North Korea and playing a major part in dealing this nuclear thing but nuclear thing which was supposed to be handled by United States of America has having a dilemma as to how it has to proceed this is also a point of conflict for Japan so what this article goes about speaking is that all these important agendas that are there with respect to India as well as Japan needs to be worked out and at the same time what India has to look cut is in terms of the trilateral and the quadrilateral formations so you have the trilateral formation in terms of India Japan and USA that is in operation Malabar exercise Malabar and then you also have the quadrilateral formations which involves India United States of America Japan as well as Australia so this will also have to be relooked in terms of the strategic perspective so on the bilateral front they'll also speak about the Shinken bullet train where land acquisition is become one of the important factors and then what we will also see is the military exchanges so for which we will have to see what Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Shinzo Abe will discuss in terms of the bullet train as well as the military exchanges we will be taking up this article once again but as of now this is all we have to understand in reference to this article in the link to this article what we have to understand is the China Japan pivot to new markets so what is this article all about yesterday we did discuss about the Asia Africa growth corridor but what this article also speaks about is the close pragmatism that Shinzo Abe has taken so in reference to the earlier articles we did see that there is a lot of tariffs that have been imposed on all countries so what China and Japan have done in this case is they have put aside all their political egos and what they have looked at is in terms of economic pragmatism as well as empowerment of their people so according to it in order to fight the tariffs that have been imposed by the United States of America both these countries have come up together and they have entered a number of agreements so what are this this will be in terms of the energy cooperation military confidence building measures in the East China Sea infrastructural development and joint development of high-end technology so both these come have come forward to fight the threat that have been emanating from United States of America on the economic front so they have set aside all their fights all their disagreements and they are here on a common platform and they have entered into key agreements why because the economics matters more and that is why they have taken a practical step of seeing the economy rather than the political angle so this is what we need to understand in terms of this article so moving on let's look into the next article Article. so the next article says migratory birds starts arriving at Chilka but numbers are down 
so this becomes an important from the prelims perspective so there are two important points one is in reference to the chilka lake and the other is in reference to the nallabana bird sanctuary so in reference to the chilka lake there are certain important facts that we have to understand so what are these facts it is a brackish water lagoon spread over puri kurda Ganjam districts of Odisha so kindly remember it is in the state of Odisha this are likely to be questioned in your prelims examination and this is at the mouth of the Daya river so there is one of the important prelims question that we will be discussing as to why this river becomes very important so it is the largest coastal lagoon in India and the second largest coastal lagoon in the world kindly remember these facts because it is prospect one in your UPSC prelims examination so this Chilka Lake was designated the first Indian wetland of international importance under the Ramsar convention and also of importance is the Nalabana bird sanctuary and this Nalabana bird sanctuary is at the heart of the Chilka Lake so where is this Nalabana bird sanctuary it is in the Chilka Lake and what is the important point is that this Bal Nalabana in Odisha basically means it is a wheat covered island and this is also part of the Ramsar convention and this particular Nalbana bird sanctuary was declared as a bird sanctuary under the wildlife protection act this is all we have to understand in reference to this article the analytical perspective with respect to the lagoons will be discussed on your geography weekly classes moving on let's look into the prelims practice questions so the prelims practice question the first question says Corbett National Park is it I mean you have the river flowing through this park is Ganga and then Kasiranga National Park the river flowing through is, is Manas Silent Valley National Park you have Kaveri flowing through this which of the following above is correctly matched so is there any of the river flowing through the any of these national parks not actually none of these is the answer so that is why I did discuss about the Daya river so UPSC has a trend of asking if there is any river that actually penetrates to this bird sanctuary or any of the other wildlife sanctuary so you have this Chilka Lake and this Chilka Lake is at the mouth of Daya River so kindly remember this fact so moving on let's look into the next practice question which of the following schedules of the Constitution of India contains provisions regarding anti-defection act why are we discussing this yesterday we did have about the Tamil Nadu issue and that is why we are discussing it and this is nothing but 10 schedule and this was asked in the previous year question papers so kindly remember it in reference to that we have one more prelims practice questions the provisions in the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule in constitution of india are made in order to what is the answer for this to protect the interests of these schedule tribes so moving on let's look into the mains practice question so what is the question here the cbi is an acting political entity under the political party in center camouflaged as an independent organization illustrate with examples and give suitable measures so what is this question all about so what this question says is that CBI though it seems to be an independent organization but it is camouflaged what do you mean by it it is not exactly an independent authority but it is in the disguise of an independent authority it is not an independent authority but it is always controlled by that political party which is at the helm of power in the central government so what we have to do is illustrate this with examples that is provide them certain evidences and then what we also have to recommend is certain measures to make it an independent body so anything for that matter the subject matter of the question is CBI in this case so always introduce the topic that we will be discussing so the CBI is nothing but a premier investigating authority that is headed by the director and it has the response responsibility to investigate grievous as well as the cases of corruption so what we have to understand is any question for that matter that is popping up in your mains answer writing you need to introduce the subject first so we have introduced the subject you don't have to give introduction as a just for explanation purposes but you will have to introduce the subject and the subject here is CBI so we have introduced what the CBI is then what we are doing is we are illustrating with examples so what are the examples the CBI had given clean chit to Chagdi's titler in the 1984 
riots so he was one of the key persons who was involved in 1984 riots but the congress was in power and jagdish taitla was closer to congress so he was given a clean sheet what should have been an independent organization fighting corruption fighting riots has not taken an independent stand why because there was a political party in center and this political party played a hand in the investigation second important point is the 2g scam and the coal allocation scam made successive cbi chiefs control the fallout again we did discuss about Ranjit Singh as well as AP Singh in terms of the 2G scam so this can also be given as an example and in fact the Supreme Court had went about and said that CBI has become a cage parrot speaking in its master's voice for supporting the claims of political party in power and then the CBI has always been engaging in nepotism wrongful prosecution and corruption as alleged in the recent cases of AP Singh and Astana whose appointment was itself questionable so these are the set of examples that you should be having always in your mind so that in case any question pops up we should be providing and what are the reforms that we should be doing in this case so the reforms are efforts to reform the cbi have been going on since famous vinit narain judgment of the 1997 through the supreme court which gave set of directions to the government to ensure the autonomy of the organization as we have already discussed one of that in independent is in reference to the tenure so what the supreme court did is it came up with a two years tenure and the central government will not be able to remove them and this is one of the reforms that have been initiated by the supreme court and then the real problem of the cba lies in its charter of duties they are not protected by the legislation they do not have a legislative backing there is no law which support it instead it functions based merely on a government resolution that draws its power from the delhi special police establishment act and this needs to be relooked so in case there is a law that is substantiating their independence and autonomy this will serve the purpose and according to the prakash singh who was an ex ips officer besides appointing the head of the cbi by a collegium we did discuss according to lokpal act there is a collegium which involves the prime minister the leader of the opposition the cgi in case of absence of the cgi we have a nominated judge in this case that is the collegium apart from this what he also recommends is that government must ensure financial autonomy for this outfit why in case there is financial dependence then they are sure to comply by the political party but if they have financial independence they would be able to take an independent stand away from the political party's ambitions and the most important point is number of officers placed within the cbi are on deputation should be reduced greater emphasis should be placed on direct recruitment of cba officers and service conditions such as promotions should be incentivized for the direct recruits to avoid any quid pro quo or political polis nexus so what is happening of late is there is one of the political parties in the state they provide all the important amenities and in the ambition for the future cbi posting what the ips officers do is they go in line with the political parties ambitions but if it is direct recruitment they would be completely independent and because there is independence that there is through the direct recruitment what this will dismantle is the political police nexus so these are the set of reforms that we should be providing but why we are discussing this is any issue or any political and administrative conflict will for sure be asked in the examination there was one of the fights that was taking place in terms of the lieutenant governor as well as the aam aadmi party in delhi and then what we saw was the question that was being asked in the upsc mains so kindly expect these type of questions in your future mains so that is why we have discussed this particular question so kindly write all your answers looking into the byju cna on the comment section so that we can evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same so this is it for today thank you so much all the best